We are just three weeks away from the 2024 NBA draft, and we are back with another episode of the Draft Show on the All Hornets Podcast Network. One podcast feed with multiple shows, making sure we cover the Charlotte Hornets and the draft and the free agency from every single angle. If you like what you hear, please subscribe on Apple Podcast, leave a five star review. The All Hornets Podcast is affiliated with the Fans First Sports Podcast Group. Today's show, we've spent a lot of time talking about players, prospects, trades, and not a lot of time talking about some of the news that's come out about this draft cycle. So we're going to kind of take the episode today to kind of look at some of the most recent Hornets draft buzz, intel, and try and figure out what is true, what might be true, and what is false. So Chase, we're going to be, you're going to be helping me through today to try and figure out what do we think is some of the smoke and who are the players who are seeing mentioned. So a nice time to kind of not be in as detail like we've had to go the last couple of weeks but just to kind of have a little look across the landscape of the 2024 NBA draft and just take stock of where we are I'm excited to do this I feel like the I guess lack of consensus maybe stamped out smokescreen season a little bit more than it has in the past like obviously last year the second pick that the Hornets had was like the inflection point in the draft whether they went Scoot Brandon Miller whoever else was basically going to decide how the rest of the draft went this year. Like we don't even know who's going number one, much less two, three, and four. So I feel like it has maybe reduced the number of like concrete rumors that we get. It's kind of just more prospects working out with certain teams. This team is interested in this group of players, which we're going to sift through all of that stuff today, at least in regards to the Charlotte Hornets. And there, I feel like there's actually been a pretty good amount of news that's come out in the last couple of weeks. So should be a good one on tap here today. Yeah, we've got a selection of quotes and little radio blurbs and edits from Jonathan Gavoni, Jeremy Wu, Christine Peak from Yahoo Sports. So there's, there's going to be a lot for us to get through today. Um, before we get onto that, I had a thought come across to myself today, which was if you did a top 10 made up of players from both this year's draft and last year's draft, what would that top 10 look like? Now, I'm just going to start listing players from last year's draft and you tell me when you want me to stop and we need to have a discussion about fitting someone in, okay? Okay. So, I think that this will be a good exercise. Victor Mbanyama, Brandon Miller, Scoot Henderson, Amen Thompson, Asal Thompson. That's probably where I would put Alex Sar between them okay. two, but... Granted, I would personally put Cam Whitmore above Alex Sar as well if they were in the same class. Okay, so you're uh, going so Alex Sar. Wow, okay, so you're going Alex yeah. Sar as well. <laughs> then you would go, uh, you go, sorry, you're going Cam Whitmore, then you would go Alex Sar. Yep, and then a Sar right after and that. Sar Thompson. Interesting. So I, I've, I, I would actually have a Sar ahead of, I would, ahead of Amen. And then I would have Zakari Rizache. And I would actually, I think I would have Jarris Walker. If I'm going off my, my pre draft rankings, I would have Jarris Walker ahead of Eamon Thompson. I would flip that now, I think. Um, Jarris Walker, let's go without the next name. You comfortable with that? Or, or are you thinking someone else from this year's class? No, I, I would take Jarris over any non Alex Sar prospect okay. for sure. Okay. Um, I'm running out of prospects with Anthony Black. Ooh, he's actually, ooh, he's kind of like a, like an inverse comparison for Topic. No, I think I, I would probably take Anthony Black over Topic. Wow. Okay. Um, he went eight, uh, uh, Taylor Hendricks, I believe it was. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd probably take him over uh, over Topic, who is my number two as well. Wow. So yeah, only only one 2023 prospect in the top in your entire top ten. So that's yeah, that's the. I mean, I'm down in this year's draft. I'm high. I'm but I'm higher than you, right? Uh, I I have Riza Shea, I think coming in at fifth. Then I have Topic at eight, Sar at nine, and Klingon at ten. I think I would have all of those guys ahead of Anthony Black. Um, I think, but it's a it's a discussion. I, I did it quickly. It took me five minutes before we started the show, but 
I just think that's an interesting idea, thought exercise to go through to give the listeners a little insight in terms of like what what do we expect from these type of players and guys like Anthony Black, Jarris Walker, they Taylor Hendricks like didn't play much this year, right? They they had roles off the bench at times that came and went as the year went. So that should help set some of the expectations, even for the guys selected at the top of this year's draft. Into now, now maybe the argument is well, if you get selected one or two, like you just very rarely like are not in the rotation at all, and maybe that's the case. But the the talent level is fairly flat. Yeah, I mean, Jarris played a good amount of games in the G League last year. I think even Amen Thompson played a few games in the G League. Yep. Uh, Jed Howard played most of his season in the G League. Like there, those are lottery picks in a much deeper draft that spent more or equal time with the G League team as they did with their NBA team. So you can only imagine that that similar thing is going to happen with players in this class, if not to an even greater extent, like, I don't know, like somebody like Cody Williams. Like he is almost certainly not fit for an NBA rotation from day one. Like what are you going to do other than put him in the G League if you draft him? And there is a chance that he gets drafted within the top six, at least. We're going to talk about him a little bit later, but you could potentially go like even higher than that. So we're definitely going to have to like maybe tamper our expectations with what we're going to see from these guys right away, because there are players in better classes that have had, you know, slow starts, you could say, I guess, or weren't in the rotation right away. So I can't imagine that a ton of these guys are going to get thrown to the wolves, knowing what we know about the perception of their upside in this class at the, at least at the top of the draft. Well said. I, I agree with everything that you said. Um, okay, let's move on to our main point here. Um, looking at some of the statements that have been buzzing around the Hornets community. Chase, you want to get started? All right. So this is the first one. This is from Jonathan Gavoni, ESPN, Draft Express. This is probably the spiciest uh, rumor that we're going to talk about. Is Dalton Connect has drawn quote-unquote, strong interest from Charlotte with the sixth pick in the NBA draft. Obviously, they're probably not looking at a point guard. They're not looking at a center. So what are we going to do? We're going to look for a wing, find some players that can fit into the middle here. So <clears throat> Dalton Connect, I think, makes sense uh, just from like a positional perspective. Obviously, he's a pretty highly regarded player in this class. James, what do you think about the maybe the legitimacy of these rumors that Connect would be drawing strong interest from Charlotte? at number six, which even though people do have a favorable opinion on him generally, I think would still be considered pretty high if the Hornets did take him at six. Yeah, I think it's probably the top of Connect's range. I've, I mean, I've actually heard of some, some kind of like theorizing about a fit in Detroit just because they struggle shooting so much. Um, but, but I think you're getting towards the top of his range there. Look, I think this is true because I think Charlotte should be having a look at everybody probably mocked from two or three to 12 in this draft, because I just don't think there's a great big difference. I mean, my tier of talent from those players runs from four to 15. And I have them pretty much all in the same tier, which basically code for like, depending on what your team is looking for, what stage of, you know, competition your team is at in terms of are they a playoff team, are they a rebuilding team? What is your play style? What are your needs on your roster? All those things, like, put them in a blender and it spits out. And I would be, like, okay with taking anyone. And if you look at Charlotte specifically, Dalton Connect is a really clear role in this team. Like, there is no other off-ball mover spacer at his size, his youth, you could compare that would be on this roster, right? Seth Curry could probably be the guy. Um, Davis Bertons, I guess, if he's going to be in Charlotte next year. But they are veteran guys who seem to be on the downside of their career and, and Connect is a much better kind of at the rim, probably mid-range scorer than those guys as well. So it doesn't shock me. Like He's got good size, 6'6", six, 6'9", six, six, wingspan. I think he actually tested really well at the Combine. And you watch some of his games this year. I mean, his last tournament game, um, who was it who was going head-to-head -head with in the in the tournament? It was out outrageous shot-making on both sides of it. Um, I'm trying to remember I now. I forget who that, that last – ah, Purdue? <clears throat> was that Purdue, I think? Was, was that the, the game that they – I think that's who they lost to. That might not be the game that you're thinking of, though. Um, I, I need to look into this now. But it, I, I've got all my notes from the game. I just didn't write who the game was against. <laughs> but 
some some of the plays he made, like strong left-handed finishes over defenders, um, some really impressive backdoor kind of off-ball cutting and just hitting movement threes. It was something that just I felt really, really stuck out to it. It was Purdue. You're right. It was that Purdue game. He finished with oh the game. Oh, yeah, and uh, the Creighton game too. I think before that as well, he had like back to back like explosive uh, scoring yeah. games. I think Baylor Shireman also had a pretty good game in that uh, Creighton matchup as well. Yeah. So I don't think it's. I don't think by any means like they are probably looking at connect more than other people in that range. But is he growing strong strong interest? Do they want to bring him in for a workout, sit down with him, have an interview with him? I think that's probably a very realistic opportunity because he gives Charlotte something that they don't really have. Size, shooting, scoring, which are all needs for the Hornets. Do you I think completely it's true? agree with you. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I feel like you don't have to like really want to take someone or be like definitive on whether or not you're going to draft a player just to have like really strong interest in them. And it makes perfect sense that the Hornets would have strong interest in a player that fills the archetype that connect does. They're also probably going to bring him in, interview him, work him out like they are with everybody else. That might mean a little bit more per se than if you're bringing in like a second round guy or a guy that has like a lower draft stock or somebody that plays point guard or center or something like that. But that, I mean, at this time of year, like the Hornets, we like to think that this new regime, given that it's run by Jeff Peterson, who was in draft scouting for so long, and that's how he like came up and made a name for himself, was working in scouting departments. Like they're going to have a much different and more detailed process that they have in the last couple of years, which I think we can already tell by the fact that the draft workouts like aren't much less being leaked. They're not being posted by the team social media account in like a graphic, but this is just another example too, is like they're just laying or casting a wide net and making sure they lay like a foundation with pretty much every player because in the next 16 days, like it's going to heat up considerably even from where we are now and whether or not like oh, yeah. Dalton Connect is actually like in play at six is one thing, but the fact that they're going to show interest in him, it would surprise me if they didn't just because of the lack of consensus yeah. in the draft. There's probably... 15 guys that they're showing like what you could probably define as like strong interest in for the sixth pick. And they're not the only team doing that either. So no, there were other teams named in that report. Portland were one. Mm -hmm. I can't remember who the other team were, um, but it wasn't just Charlotte that were drawn. I think it was Chicago too. It was basically Chicago. everybody in like the latter half of the top yeah. 10 essentially. Yeah. Um, and you talk about Jeff Peterson's draft record. Well, 2019, the Hawks had the fourth pick. And they went and drafted, again, another much older player at the time, DeAndre Hunter, who was only a sophomore, but he was like 21 and a half years old on draft night, which is pretty old for a sophomore. Um, now, Connect has taken that to like new levels because I believe he's going to be 23 on draft night. Um, yes, he but will be. Jeff Peterson is someone who's shown he, he's not scared to take a multi-year player it, towards the top of the draft if he thinks it's right. And like that... Hawks team probably had a need for like a defensive wing and they kind of went out and got that with Hunter and threw away all these upside guys like Reddish and other things like that out the window. Um, and you could see him maybe making that same decision as Charlotte with Dalton Connect. It wouldn't surprise me. Look, it's not what I would do. I've got other guys on my board, but I could very quickly see why that why they picked it and I could talk myself into it. Okay. Moving on to the next one. This report is from Kristen Peak of Yahoo Sports, who he went on a Utah Jazz radio station, and they asked her, is there anyone in the kind of consensus top of the draft who you think, like, won't make it to the Jazz at 10? And she just came out and said, like, and it wasn't even a question about Stefan Castle, but her quote exactly was, I don't think Stefan Castle makes it past six. And that's exactly how she said it. Uh, Chase, do you think that is true? may be true or false. This one certainly may be true. I don't know if I lean too strongly in either direction, just because, I, like I said, again, like there's no consensus with this. You could tell me Stefan Castle goes number two, number four. He falls to like eight or nine. And I think all of those are like reasonably or like at least reasonable or plausible scenarios that in a given year, like maybe there wouldn't be like, such a wide range for some player that a lot of people have number one, but 
this year, I feel like it's going to be really, really difficult to nail down picks or like a range for a player, mm-hmm. like what types of teams are going to be interested in them other than like Alex Sar, Zachary Sachet, Nikola Tokic, sure? like guys that are almost are like, sure? I, but you're, you're right. Even then, like you I'm really sure. don't know. Nikola Topic could fall at the top 10. Right. There is some rumblings going on that Alex Saar could maybe like even be, not be in the top two, which I know I'm just assuming will happen. I, I don't think anything is set. Like I was listening yeah, I agree. to Ryan Rusillo the other day and, and he was talking about this exact thing, saying that people around the NBA are looking at the mock drafts and they're all looking at each other kind of going, why do all the mock drafts just think Saar and Risa are going to go one or two? Because when you speak to people in and around the league, the diversity and thought on who one and two are are so vastly different. There is no consensus that they are the one and two, but there is in the mock draft community. So there does seem to be a little bit of a disconnect there about if those two will even be at the top of draft. And if that's the case, there's no real way to be definitive about whether or not someone like Stefan Castle, who for his own right is like, maybe not one of the top prospects like in the mainstream, but is definitely like right up there. There, I think Sam Vecini has him as his number one player with the athletic. Obviously Sam is like a well-respected longtime draft analyst, but then there are other people that have him like maybe a little bit closer to 10 or at least like closer to number five. Like that, that type of range is like pretty rare. I feel like for somebody that's like a top mm-hmm. prospect and this year especially it's going to be so hard i think to nail down a definitive range i mean he certainly could not make it past number six but what that entails is a whole different story that could be the hornets picking him that could be a team trading with the hornets to pick him whether that's moving down to get another prospect or up to get him there's just no way to predict what's going to happen on june 26th so it's tough for me to really lean one way or the other i'm gonna be brave I'm going to say this is true. Um, there we go. Put your I'm flag gonna, down. I'm going to put my flag down. I was I was going to use that exact phrase. That's really weird. <laughs> I was literally going to say, I'm going to put my flag down on this. Um, Took the words right out of your mouth. You did. Uh, <laughs> if there was a bet over under, let's put it this way, and it was over under six and a half, I would bet the under quite considerably. I think even if Saar or uh Riza Shea don't go one or two I think that probably boosts Castle stock because he could be one of the guys who shoots up into that range um I just think Stefan Castle is the perfect intersection of like he gives you a, a hard work culture player which this team needs he has some untapped upside we didn't get to see and he fits exactly what the Charlotte Hornets kind of need in terms of position skill set this like perfect intersection of need, skill, uh, and potential. And I don't see how the Charlotte Hornets could pass up on Stefan Castle. In this uncertainty with everything else, you look at all the things that he does. Now, the only argument is that the floor spacing, you talk about the Celtics, and you know, you're coming away from probably one of the best spaced offense since the Warriors, right? And how does Stefan Castle fit into that? I, I understand that argument, but the Hornets are so far away, I think, from having to worry about like the depths of the playoffs that right now you need to bring in some defensive toughness. So I'm going to say this is true because even if Charlotte don't keep the pick, I think someone would trade up to get Stefan Castle at six, and that might be something that happens. So I'm going to agree, Kristen. I don't think Stefan Castle makes it past six. There we go. Kristen Peake's got some support in the Charlotte Hornets community. Absolutely. Next up, Jonathan Gavoni. He reported some prospects unwilling to work out for Charlotte. Um, now, that was reported a little bit a while ago. Uh, and he has since talked about how he kind of maybe thinks that was more to do with scheduling rather than like players not wanting to work out for Charlotte and how he thinks they'll be able to get who they want in the end. Um, but there's obviously some conflicting reports there. I didn't think Gavoni was the only one to report about some players being unwilling to work out for Charlotte. And there was the whole Stefan Castle. I don't want to work out for teams where there's not a point guard report that, that Gavoni also put out. Um, let's just kind of try and take away some of the noise. Do you think there are prospects who are unwilling to work out for the Charlotte Hornets in this draft cycle? So I think yes, but probably not for the reasons that have been 
previously reported. Like, I think it's probably, I, I mean, it may be like Stefan Castle or Donovan Klingen or Topa or whoever it is that w- would be or was rumored to have not been re- working out with the Hornets. But I feel like it's more so just from like the standard draft position posturing that like agents and player camps do around this type of year more so than really anything that has to do with the Hornets. And because I feel like, and this is something that's been mentioned, I feel like a few times this year, that's kind of like where the draft like is going to make like another shift is like the, the, that sixth pick, because there's obviously like not really a consensus, but there is somewhat of a range of players that are expected to go at the top of the draft. It's just where they go or in what order remains to be seen. But after that, like you're kind of dropping off from like, the Zachary Sachets, Donovan Klingens of the world, back down to like the Dalton Connect, Cody Williams, Modest Buzelis, like Tajan Saloon. There's a like maybe slightly less appeal, I think, to that group of players than like the top of the draft, like Alex Sar, Risa Shea, Topic, all of them. So at that point, like you're probably more so just trying to steer yourself in like a specific direction or at least position yourself among that like second tier of prospects to be the first one off the board, regardless of like what team is there, because we're like, we, nobody can predict the amount of movement that's going to happen, but there's probably going to be some like in terms of teams moving up and down the draft board. So I feel like it's more just in preparation for those types of things and just putting like an agent, putting their prospect in the best position possible to maximize their draft stock rather than being like, we do not want to play for the Charlotte Hornets. Like, I feel like there's a lot of wiggle room between like being unwilling to work out in a place and then just being totally unwilling to play there. Like when you start your NBA career. Yeah. I mean, look, if there's a report that comes out tomorrow that Zachary Risa worked out for the Charlotte Hornets, you know, what's going to happen. The draft news is going to start buzzing. Is Risa exactly. going to slide on draft night? Right. And then the other teams who maybe were going to take Risa Shea later on and go, wait, why aren't the other teams in the top five going to take Risa Shea? What, what do we miss? What do they know that we don't, right? And then the snowball starts going and crazy stuff happens. So uh, I completely understand what you mean. Um, I'm also saying this is true, but I, I think partly for your reason, but, but also just partly because I still think Charlotte has a reputation issue. And on top of that, they have two young star players who are kind of, well, three, if you took out Mark Williams as well, which uh, Gabe Plotkin listed in the Encore recently, like they have their building foundation high usage stars. Like that's the way it's kind of been built. And if you're wanting to be someone who wants to go and take that role, the shot isn't a great landing spot for you. Now, you could argue there's not that many places that are. Okay, Detroit, you've got Cade Cunningham, Portland, you've got Scoo Henderson. Like, I don't know if there's any of these places that are just giving rolling the ball out on day one and being like, here you go, apart from Washington. But even outside of that, I know there is new ownership. I know there's new coaching. I know there's new front office. It is going to take time before players have been part of the Hornets program and word gets around the league that Charlotte is no longer, you know, acting like a substandard NBA team. And that's going to take a couple of years until people have actually had the experience. So, it wouldn't surprise me that, right, if you have a list of five workouts to do between four to eight and you can you have to cut one of them, I could completely understand someone cutting the Charlotte Hornets for all the reasons that we just talked about. So I'm saying this is true as well. I think there's also one more thing just to add on to. The Hornets of all the teams that are like, at least were at the top of the draft lottery odds before they fell to number six, like the Hornets had the third best odds in this draft lottery of all those teams at the top, other than maybe San Antonio, just because they have Wemby, the Hornets, I think probably have the most like plausible, realistic path to being a play in or playoff caliber team next year. It's just a lot of it is just being healthy anyway. And then another one is just making like one or two moves and bolstering your bench and your lineups a little bit. That's not necessarily the most appealing situation to be in for a draft prospect. Like you you have a very thin margin for error there. If you're not contributing to a team at a level where at which they can win in the playoffs or win enough in the regular season to make the playoffs, you're out of the rotation. You're in the G League. Like That's not the goal for every draft pick, unless you're being drafted in the 20s or the 30s. If you're dra- being drafted sixth, you want to be playing like right away so you can showcase that you were worth the sixth draft pick and that your value as a player, not only just to your team, but to the league as a whole, won't go down. And 
We've seen that that can happen very quickly when you draft someone, say, with the 11th pick uh, and they don't work out immediately and it becomes very clear immediately that they are not going to be able to contribute to your team. Their value diminishes exponentially. And Noah Vonley, James Booknight, Kai yep. Jones, right? Yep. The Charlotte Hornets have been down that path before. We know how that goes. And, mm -hmm. and just to build on what you said, if they re-sign Miles Bridges, this full Ex start yep. is written in Sharpie. Before maybe training. five, like maybe five, because if you're not a four, you're not taking Grant Williams' spot either. Like, well, maybe, <laughs> right? So, so like straight away, you're like, well, Brandon Miller, Mark Williams, Melly Ball, Mark, they're all going to be starting for the next three years. Like, when when am I going to get my chance? So, yeah, I agree. I think this makes a lot of sense as to why why that would be the case. All right. So next one, another one from uh, John Gavoni. Cody Williams said we'd be talking about him a little bit later, and here it is. He has been drawing interest from Charlotte inside the top 10 as well, similarly to Dalton Connect. Just seems to be someone that is at least being named in the groups of prospects that the Hornets are monitoring and considering with that sixth pick. Uh, again, another wing makes sense. He would pretty easily slot into the lineup, whether that's next to, you know, or between like Brandon Miller and a four or as the, the two, Brandon Miller's a third, whatever it is. All of these guys fit very easily into Charlotte's depth chart and their positional or their lineups positionally. So I think this one is definitely true. I mean, especially because Cody Williams is regarded as one of the higher upside wings at that stage of the draft as well. I could very easily see him being the pick at six or this tweet mentions inside the top 10, maybe a slight trade down to maximize the value a little bit there. But yeah, I, I, this one is definitely true. Any Any wing... I think is like a pretty strong like suit to be or pretty strongly favored to be rumored or working out with the Hornets right now. So you're right. If the report had said is in contention for six, I would have called this false because I, I truly don't believe Cody Williams is a guy that you have to take at six. I think there would be deals on the board here that you could get further back because his pre-draft process, it feels like he is, He's not rocketing up, let's put it that way. He is staying static or like sliding out the back end of the lottery in that kind of 11 to 15, 16 range. Six feels a little bit high. Look, he's a theoretical player. He's not someone we've talked about yet on the, on the podcast, but like if he wasn't Jalen Williams' brother, let's just be honest, he's getting a little bit less draft buzz than he probably is getting now. There is hope that you look at Jalen Williams and go, if Cody fills out like Jalen Williams does with his frame – then that is crazy because Cody Williams is like a 6'9 guy in shoes, um, even taller than his brother. Very much like a very, very thin, yes, he shot 41% from three. That is a fake number, okay? He took one and a half attempts per game, um, super low volume. I think that's a questionable, um, I think he's probably just like a okay college shooter for a freshman, like probably... No, nothing that I'm saying he's coming into the NBA from day one and is going to be a plus three-point shooter. Um, defensively, is probably the selling point. His length, his activity, like half a steal, half a block and 20 minutes per game. I wish he rebounded better. Like, I really, really wish he had a better motor on that end for the rebounding. He did guard a lot of point guards, so I think that's part of the reason. But there's – he's a long way away. Like, he is a project in – in quite a lot of terms, I think, because he needs to get stronger. He needs to have a more versatile, balanced offensive skill set. He was in like a, he played as a role player this year in college. And going on to the NBA floor, you need to have real diversity in your skill set and be able to do lots of things if you're not just going to be a guy who can shoot open threes. And I don't think he'll be able to do that. I even heard him on a podcast today on the Ringers Draft Show podcast saying that in his pre draft workout, that NBA three-point line's really far away. <laughs> you know, that was an adjustment, he said. It was a bit, he said it was a shock at first. It's really far away. And that's code for I was not shooting the ball as well as I was hoping I would when I started practicing on the NBA three-point line. Yes, adjustments will come, but I mean, do you agree with me here that Cody Williams is probably like he is probably a G League player in his year one in the NBA? Yeah, for sure. Like I, I mentioned earlier, if you draft him with really any expectation that he's going to be an impactful member of your rotation, at least at the beginning of the season, if not for like the entirety of his rookie year, I think you're probably setting yourself up for disappointment with 
Cody Williams as a prospect. And that's not even necessarily a bad thing. Like he could very well. And if we're going to continue with the brother comparison here, Jalen wasn't really like a high level NBA prospect as a freshman at Santa Clara, but he I'm went back that. and got physically like just got more athletic essentially as a sophomore at Santa Clara exploded and became like a top 20 consensus guy that got picked in the lottery by the thunder. Now he's like a super good player and has continued like filling out and is basically built like a Mack truck. Now Cody doesn't really look like he's going to be built like that in his physical prime, but he is taller. So that kind of counteracts that a little bit, but like that took a year for Jalen. Like that he was in college for that year. Cody will not be, he'll be in the G league or the NBA which that certainly has its positives in terms of getting in like a better strength and conditioning program, having an NBA team that is invested in your development, like care, like holding you, nurturing you along as you like develop physically and uh, on the court. But yeah, I mean, none of that is going to come very quickly. And even after one full year, like he might not be fully ready to contribute on that, like next opening night of his second season. So, and in the NBA, you really don't get that much time. Like you get, one year of like development in the G League where you don't have to make an impact. If you're not showing something in the first half of that second season, like you're just going to fizzle out. And like, I, I feel like Cody Williams, not to go too far on like his NBA career or anything like that, but that is definitely something that would like that the Hornets would have to be like concerned about is like, and that's where the inside the top 10, I think of this Cody Williams rumor comes in is like, you are, if you take that guy at six, like you got to be, very careful with that development pattern to make sure. It's yeah, that's a that's a super, super, super risky pick because you know you're not getting move, any return right away. first move as a lead exactly. decision maker in the draft is to take like a project guy. Now, the, the argument for Cody Williams is you say that injuries derailed the season, okay? He had uh, an eye injury to play with a mask for the second half of the season. He had an ankle injury. Before that, for the first 12 games of the season, he was at 15 points, three and a half rebounds, two assists, a full steal, 0.7 block, shot 52% from three on higher volume, 62% from two. Like, you're talking a, a much better player. The problem is, after all those injuries, he just became a shell of himself. Was that confidence? Was that flow? Was that he was actually playing hurt? Like, there was a bunch of kind of unknowns with how it is. and. This is what makes evaluation so hard. Like, is he that player? Or is he the player who in the last 13 or so games got like nine points and two rebounds and shot 31% from three? Like, there's just... He's a complete jackal and hide looking at his draft tape this year. And you could talk yourself into one or the other. And there's like reasons, for, good reasons for both. But is there is an element of risk there. And I think that's why I just think it's six... There are safer prospects with much higher floors. Okay, moving on to our next one from Jeremy Wu uh, about Reed Shepard. And he wrote, Shepard's range appears somewhat narrow at this stage. And his draft position is likely begins at number three with the Houston Rockets. The San Antonio Spurs, Detroit Pistons, and Charlotte Hornets are all viable landing spots early on. So what that is kind of saying, if I translate, is... He could get picked as early as three with Houston and he could get picked as late as Charlotte six. And that is his narrow draft range is basically to go between three to six. You could rephrase that as number six is Reed Shepard's floor. A little bit like the conversation we had about Stefan Castle earlier. Okay. It's saying the same thing, but kind of in a different way. Um, do you buy that again? If Reed Shepard were to fall to six, similar question to what we had earlier with Stefan Castle. And if they're both there, then the floor really doesn't exist. But do you buy that Reed Shepard's floor is Charlotte at six? Yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to have to lean towards yes on this one, just because the NBA seems to be really high on him. And not to say that that's not right. I mean, he was blisteringly efficient in pretty much every single way. He obviously had tons of big games, both offensively and defensively for Kentucky has been probably the biggest like stock riser since the beginning of last year. Like there was nobody that had him in the mm. top five to start last season. Nobody really even thought he was a one and done to begin with. Now it seems like he's a, getting picked like third through six at the absolute minimum, a, pretty much a lock for like the top five. I definitely believe it. I, I don't think I would personally be in, in that boat myself, 
Uh, but I, and all of those teams do kind of need a player of his ilk, especially San Antonio. Like they could obviously use like a shooting point guard that can play defense as well. Like that would just give them a very versatile two way lineup with Wemby and all the other young players that they have there. Uh, I don't, I mean, I don't know about how interested I guess any of these teams are like in a concrete manner, but I would be shocked if he falls like much further than that, just because some other team is going to see him falling and then just capitalize on that. And I mean, maybe six isn't like the absolute floor, but I would, I would be surprised if it was really any lower than that, just given how much the NBA seems to like him. Could you imagine if you'd read Shepard in for a workout and he didn't shoot the ball well? Holy shit, that'd be scary, right? Yeah, that would be what, what that would be like, like a back to the drawing board type of moment almost. <laughs> it's like, okay, we gotta just re- all right, let's go back to North Laurel High School. We're watching everything over the past two years. Like, we gotta redo this whole thing. It's the guy running your workout comes over. Jeff, is, is this guy supposed to be a shooter? Like, yeah. was he not shooting the ball well? Uh no. Like, like he only made 72 <laughs> of his threes in the star in the Warm up. It's like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Um. Look, I I think all the reporting, like you suggests, but I've seen small guards slip too many times on draft night. And tell me, how many guys Reed Shepard size played in either of the conference finals of these four last teams that made it? Okay. You would uh, maybe argue Mike Conley, who's made an all defensive team, I believe, in his career. And is like one of the best veterans in the league. Um, he might even be taller, I think, as well. Maybe I'm not sure. Peyton Pritchard, who is struggling to get on the floor for the Boston Celtics right now, and there's some people use as a comp actually for Reed Shepard, um, but is just getting targeted by everybody. Basically, Luke, well, not everybody, Luka Doncic, whenever he's on the court. I I don't know if there was anyone else, and. When you just have super undersized guards, it makes it so hard on everybody in your team, even if they are defensively feisty and they read the game well. Like Peyton Pritchard, I would say, does all those things. I would say, yes, all absolutely. Those things. He, he plays really, really hard in the same way that Reed Shepard does as well. There is only so much you can do when you are that size and you don't have like a, you know, six, eight wingspan or something crazy like, you know, DeAnthony Melton has. Um, so, that's my concern is you just don't see guys of his size playing big leverage minutes in big playoff games. Now, you could argue, well, the Hornets don't need to worry about that. Okay. But equally, surely you want to draft players that you can see projected to go on and perform in the highest stage, right? So that's where I am with Reed Shepard. I'm, I'm torn I, I like the skill set. I like the defense flashes. I like the offense. I think there's untapped playmaking. I think he's super smart. I just struggle to get over the archetype of player that he is and looking what's in front of me. I'm in the exact same boat as you. Like, you put him in just a simple terms. He can shoot. He can dribble. He can pass. He can defend the point of attack. But when you, like, extrapolate that over the course of an entire season and an entire playoff run. Does he do those things at an impactful level when you can almost certainly assume he's not shooting over 50% from the field? He's definitely not shooting 52% from three. Like what does that player look like when you scale that efficiency down to 45% from the field and 42% from three. And that's even still might be pretty, that's really, really efficient from a player that's that small and not a supreme athlete. Like, what does that look like? Like, I just, I find it so, so hard to believe that that player returns starter level value, especially in a playoff team or on a playoff team or in like a general situation. Maybe if the Spurs draft him and you have potentially the best defensive player in NBA history standing behind you, different story. Every other team in the league, I I'm very worried about what like the floor for that might look like, and the fact that there's not as high of a ceiling as we're maybe being led to believe by a lot of like people that are mainstream outlets that are high on him after watching him torch the SEC all year. Yeah, so I'm saying I think this could be true. I think it's false. I, I just I, undersized guards slip on draft night. It's uh, a lesson as old as time. 
All right, we got one more here. This one is from Jonathan Gavoni again. Start the quote here. With less than a month before the draft, Charlotte has been connected to perimeter players with the team said to be high on the long-term future of Mark Williams, which might preclude drafting Donovan Klingon as an option at number six. I mentioned this earlier. We already know they're not looking for point guards. We already know, and now we know they're not looking for centers. This kind of ties in with all the talking that we've been doing about wings so far. Nearly every player that we've mentioned. But you basically. say we know that. What, what do you mean we know that? Well, I mean, I can imagine they're not going to be drafting a lead ball handler with Lamella there. That's, what we, that's what we imagine. We don't yes. know. Uh, well, that's, it, I guess that, yeah, I guess that is poor wording on my, I mean, if we, do, if we, we like to think we know that because otherwise I feel like that is a, a bit of a, and we'd have to be asking a lot more questions, I think, about like the direction of the front office, mm -hmm. I guess, I should say, if we don't know. National people we, are. I, I think yeah. sometimes we get blinded as being people who follow the Hornets, that will the is here. But like you've seen Jonathan Gavoni mentioned multiple times, like something phrased like around there's questions around the league have there are questions around Lamella Ball's future in Charlotte, you know. And that's obviously not from the Hornets, but that's from like other people, other teams going, I wonder what they're gonna do with with that guy. Um, so there are breadcrumbs there. This is not like no one has talked about it. I think, like, I've, I've been on the record. I would not trade Lamella Ball now. Even if I've decided Lamella Ball is not the point guard of the future that we want and we want to move on from him, I would never trade him now because his trade value will never be lower, right? You get a, a half a season out of him, another full season, and if you still feel that way then, okay. That that's that's when you can go and make the move, but you have to take the risk for me to, to get the trade value up. So I don't think it's going to happen now, but there are some breadcrumbs out there for the for the first time. You're beginning to see some whispers. Yeah, but that's definitely fair. But I, I do think that's you made a good point in saying that that's definitely coming from like outside sources rather it than is. the Hornets yeah. themselves. I think they're an easy team to pick on right now with how terrible they've been the last two years and how injured LaMelo has been, especially. But that, that narrative may change pretty quickly, I think, if they come out of the gates hot next season and LaMelo is a big part of it, like he's been at times in the past. So hopefully that we get back to that. But this rumor specifically does mention the long-term future of Mark Williams, which, mm -hmm. I mean, I know you both you and I think, yeah, he's obviously not as good as LaMelo Ball. Why would somebody like Mark Williams or the level of player that he projects to be, I guess, or has, has shown that he could be in his... 50 or 60 something games that he's played in the NBA. Why would he preclude a team from drafting a player like Donovan Klingon, who has gotten buzzed at, at the number one spot, like much less than being available at six? Why do you think that, you know, or do you think, I guess, that Mark Williams should rule out any other center? Uh, I wouldn't. I, I didn't think that's the case. Um, this is my own personal opinion. I think they should be looking at everybody. Like, like I say, the sample size for Mark Williams is not big enough for me to say, yeah, book him in, starting center for the next five years. I, like, there's been great flashes. I think he's shown some really interesting stuff. There's just not been enough consistency over a long period of time for me to book that in. The injuries as well, we just can't overlook those. They are a concern. But you look at the, the again, the finals, like the size has been such a, a theme all the way through. Like the, the centers have been different makers on all these teams. And just having depth, like having two guys who are starter level centers, just sounds like a great problem to have to me. And like in a draft of uncertainty, Donovan Klingon is certain. Like I know what he is going to be. The absolute peak probably relies on like, does he ever shoot it? other than that but but he's going to be you're going to have 48 good minutes of center play now yes i'd prefer a little bit more like diversity and skill set maybe some outside shooting with one of them to give you an option but you could argue you've got that with with grant williams as a small ball five option but what i think they should do is is be open to it i have to say this report that i've got here in front of me from gavoni and what i've heard from people close to the organization does suggest that I think this might be accurate, actually. I think this might be true. As much as I disagree with it, I do think the team are very high in Mark Williams' future. And I think this is just my own opinion of, of why I think the team are, are set on this way, is Donovan Klingon doesn't want to be coming off the bench 
like behind Mark Williams. If you draft him, Mark Williams is going to be upset with it. And just that dynamic would be, I'm guessing some people feel like that's untenable. Now, there is only one way onto the court for both those players. With a lot of these other prospects we've talked about, there are multiple ways, depending on lineups, matchups, they can play two, three, four, whatever it is. It's not the same in the center position. So that's that's my theory. Um, and I, look, they could draft Donovan Klingon and I'm not going to be flawed, but some of the rumblings I've heard suggest that they do like Mark Williams and they might be looking at perimeter options as well, which is something else that uh, Gavoni's uh, referenced in this piece. So I think I think this is true. I also want to say too, I feel like the framing of these is not necessarily accurate. Like it's not Mark like it's not Mark Williams that is precluding you from drafting Donovan Klingon. It's having Mark Williams and Nick Richards because, like you said, having two good centers isn't a bad thing. Like you're not drafting Donovan Klingon to replace Mark Williams. You're drafting him to replace Nick Richards, and then you can move Nick Richards or put him on the bench and whatever you got to do from there. Like he's obviously, I've said this before too. He's like one of the most tradable guys on the roster. Good within his role, makes $7 million. Every team is kind of in need of a backup center at a given time, unless they have a player like Nick Richards on their roster. Like if you draft Donovan Klingon, you could just move Nick Richards and you would have two gargantuan human beings like that can give you very, very high level, potentially two guys with like all defense rim protection. And then it gives Lamelo a ball screen partner and two guys that are growing as like handoff and being able to like handoff hubs, being able to read the game, maybe put the ball in the deck a little bit from there, like finishing the short roll and stuff. Like that is the exact type of player that you want with Lamelo. Like if you could give yourself 48 minutes of extremely high quality, like role playing center, why not? Like we haven't really gotten that so far. We've had Mark be good and then Nick be fine. Why not? have those two guys both be good if that's like how the draft board falls and Klingon is the best guy there I see, I see no reason to not yeah. take him and at least just see how it goes agreed um names that we haven't heard at all no, not referenced once or connected to the Charlotte Hornets the one that sticks out to me is Matas Bezelis who is probably projected right in the range Charlotte pick and he has not yet been mentioned at all and if you were to believe that this latest report you know, that the Hornets being connected to perimeter players. I guess you could say Bazelis is a perimeter player, but but it doesn't, it feels it's more like talking about kind of like twos, threes rather than threes, fours like Bazelis is. But he is one name that I've not seen linked anywhere. Um, I think to Jane Salou, I can't do the name. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a name snob and to Jan Saloon. There we go. Right. I struggle with it. I want to say something different every time I read it. Um, he's someone that I've not really seen like linked with Charlotte, although I've seen some buzz about him being looked at, you know, in the, the middle of the lottery. Uh, Saar and Rizache, I think, are projected a little bit higher. Topic isn't a guy I've heard at all, probably for reasons you outlined with Lamella Ball. Ron Holland, we didn't talk about this, but I think Ron Holland is another guy who has been floated, I think, alongside Cody Williams' name as a guy the Hornets mm-hmm. might be interested in and like the back you know, in the, in the lottery as well. So he is someone who has been mentioned. But Buzelis certainly sticks out as a guy not mentioned once anywhere, but is perfectly in the Hornets range. Like, basically the only one who hasn't been mentioned. Is there, like, a trait uh, that you could see among all of the players that have been mentioned that they share and then one that Buzelis does not? I think maybe the only thing is that all of the other guys they've looked at are, like, quality athletes for their position Buzelis is Buzelis maybe, not a quality athlete I maybe I mean I don't personally I feel like he would be fine I have no idea what the NBA thinks I feel like if he was viewed in that way he would have a pretty high draft stock having been an efficient or not an, or having been an inefficient player in the G League he still showed like he could make shots and then obviously has the shot blocking and stuff like that as ancillary skills so I don't know. I mean, I feel like, and the the thing is too, is like the, what people like analysts think and people online think about players and what the NBA thinks about players in this class has got to be wildly different just given how like weak this class is perceived to be. I I can only imagine like 
how different a top 30 would be from one NBA team to another. And then one NBA team to like a casual, like draft analyst or something like that, which that makes it like even harder for me too, is like, does the NBA even like Modest Buzelis as a top 10 guy? Like who knows? Like he might be like a 10 to 20 guy for them in the way that like Tyler Smith or something is for many draft Twitter people. It's, it's, it's difficult to decipher this year. I'm, I'm excited to move on when there's more concrete, like ordering at the top of the draft in 2020. If we get that, I, I don't know if we will. Um, Jonathan Gavoni had Matas Buzelis listed as the best leaper and dunker in this year's draft class. In I saw time. that. Yeah, that I don't. That's, I, what, that's why I said to you when you said like yeah. he's not a good athlete. I was like, and it is like he finished top fifteen in all the testing at the draft combine. He's a thirty-eight inch vertical at six ten. Um, he was talking that he was throwing back down windmills in, in, in the G League, putting in putbacks. He thinks he'll be in the dunk contest next February. I mean, it sounds like he's, you know, I, I think Gavoni seems to be, I think, I, I, I don't believe he's the best leaper dunker in the class. I think he's like a no. good athlete for someone who's 6'10". I think that's just kind of like, I don't quite know. I don't know. I feel like maybe he wanted to write about Buzelis, so he decided to kind of shoehorn it into that category maybe. Um, but yeah, I didn't view him as a bad athlete. I, I can't see any consistent thing running through other than maybe he should they should view him strictly a four and they're going to bring Miles Bridges back. And if they view Buzelis as a four and you're going to bring Miles Bridges back, then you go, Are we really going to draft up a guy who can only play back at power forward for however many minutes per game when we've got Grant Williams and Miles Bridges on the roster? That's the only thing that I can see because I think Cody, I think Ron. I think they're all small forwards, uh, Dalton Connect, shooting guards, small forward. That's probably the only thing that I can look and go. And maybe Saloon, you could, you could say that as well, right? Maybe he's a four as well. So maybe that's it, that they're not being connected to power forwards in the draft. Okay. Well, Chase, we've come to the end of the show. Um, we've broken down all the rumors. What do we think is true? What do we think is maybe true? What do we think is false? I'm sure there'll be many more reports in the next three weeks here before we get to draft night. Um, but everybody, thanks for listening, and we will catch you later in the week. Thanks, guys. See you. <clears throat>